Let's all get a Robin hymn this morning and turn together to hymn number 115. Hymn number 115. Let's stand together and sing. Stand in on the promises. I'm glad we're standing on the sure foundation this morning. Amen. Amen. It's good to see in the Lord's house today. It's always good to be in the Lord's house. And I want to tell you, that singing sounded good. Amen. Amen. That's just worth coming to church for. Uh, but anyway, it is good to be in the Lord's house. and It's good to be saved. It's also good to know that you're saved. Amen. And where we find that out? From the Word of God. Amen. And about His promises. And about His love for us. It is good to see each and every one of y'all. Before we go to the Lord in prayer, uh, uh, we ask for uh, requests this morning for prayer, for, for needs. Uh, let's remember our pastor in Beverly uh, as they deal with uh, COVID. And uh, Lord, just uh, touch them and help them uh, as they're at home to rest and, and, and get healed, healed and be back. Anybody else have a prayer request? Let's remember the service this morning. Uh, just thank the Lord for the singing thus far. And just thank the Lord for his presence. And 
And uh, let's uh, remember our speaker this morning, Brother Wade, as he stands before us and shares with us what the uh, Gideons are doing. Uh, sort of like what Brother Earl Alexander said one time. He said, uh, he said, you know what the Gideons do. Just let me brag on Jesus. So, Brother, if you just want to brag on Jesus, that'll be all right. We know what y'all do. <laughs> we know what y'all do. All hearts free. If not, I'm going to ask uh, Brian if he would to pray for us this morning. In the way of announcements, we had uh, 30 um, for Sunday school this morning, and appreciate all of them. And just let me encourage you, if you're not in Sunday school, come on up. Just get up just a little bit earlier. It'll be all right, but we invite you to Sunday school. Wonderful, wonderful teachers that you just tell they, they take time and, and study and prepare and, and hearing from the Lord and, and just to hear them expound in the scriptures and thank the Lord for them. Brother Brian, Children's Church. How the world's everybody doing this morning? Good, thanks. Good to be in God's house this morning. I'll tell you what's the truth. Uh, we learned a couple of weeks ago about we were smarter than donkey. You remember that? Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not, apparently. But uh, today, I want to tell you about Kate, the mule. TV Paul's over going, uh-oh. In the book of uh, 1 Chronicles, chapter number 16, verse 23, the Bible says, Sing unto the Lord all the earth. Show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the heathen, his marvelous works among all nations. Day by day, day to day, to uh, declare the great salvation of Jesus. So I just discovered we had a famous mule on a mountain yesterday. And uh, it lived not far from me, Dylan, to be honest with you. And it would was given food and was given water and given shelter and protection and everything that a mule could ask to have. And even the uh, grandchildren, the man who owned it, would like to ride that donkey once in a while. And they said that get it over, excuse me, mule, would get it over against the stairs so they would you know, get up on his back to ride. But as they did that, he would kind of, or she would kind of sashay over a little bit like that. And I can imagine if he's like Moses, kind of looked at him with him eyes, like, so, you know, you're not getting on my back. But her job was she was a plow, uh, plow mule. So her job was go out in the field and plow. And I was told that William would holler at her all day long. Gee, and ha, and let's go, and move, and go all day long. Just aggravate him death, sounded like to me. But then when the time come, though, when the reins fell off you know, her head, and the plow was unhooked, there ain't nobody had to tell her nothing about going to the barn. You didn't get in her way, again, the way I took it, or she might just run over you, because she was headed home. She knowed the way. And I couldn't help but think about that as, as us as Christians and how we are with the Lord and how that if God had intended us to go on home, then the moment He saved us, He'd have took us on home, wouldn't He? But He left us here. He left us with the work to do, did He not? And I could see myself as Kate and Lord just having just frustrated, aggravated, will you do what I've asked you to do? I could just see that as I'm doing the things that maybe I want to do. And I thought the important things, you know, reading the Word of God right here, praying, helping your neighbor, telling somebody about Jesus, the daily things, day by day, showing the salvation that He's brought in our lives. Sing, He said, sing of the salvation. But I'm afraid I'm like Kate. I don't want to do the work sometimes because it's hard. And it's hot out here. And that plow's heavy back there. And I'm tired of being yelled at, you see. i got plenty of excuses. But the truth is, I was made to work. The donkey and, and, and the, the horse create a mule. The mule was made to work. That's his job. It's provided by the master everything it needs. 
But his job is to work. But we get our eyes on home sometimes, don't we? Sure, there ain't nothing wrong. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to go home. It's a place of rest. It's good. But we got a job to do. So I got a few <clears throat> Christians here or like some things. Some of them's like wheelbarrows. They no good unless they're pushed. Some of them's like canoes. A lot of them, they need to be paddled. They're like kites. So you got to be kept on a string or they're going to fly away. Or like kittens that they're more content when they're petted. Or like a football when you don't know which way it's going to bounce next. Or like a balloon maybe full of wind and ready to blow up. Maybe they're like a trailer that has to be pulled. Maybe they're like a light. You know, lights are going on and off. But here's one I like. And then there's some. Seem like a small fuse, but there's some that are always seeking the Holy Spirit to lead them. And that's where I want to be at. We led as he's allowed me to stay here to do those things he's asked me to do. Not grudgingly or not aggravated by it, but do it because he loved me. And every one of us that been saved could say that he saved us when we didn't deserve it, but he did anyway. And he loved us when we didn't love him. And he takes care of us day to day. So he's asking much out of us to speak of his salvation that somebody today lost so desperate needs. I don't think it's too hard at all. All right. Any prayer requests from over here? Children's Church? Children's Church. Bible school. Let's remember Brother Wade back here as he brings what he's got for us today and what the Gideons are doing. They're taking the very Word of God out to the, this lost and dying world. And salvation's found within him. Anything else? So we're going to pray. All right, Father, we come to you now in the name of Jesus, Lord. And Lord, this morning, I confess to you, Lord, the many faults and failures in my life, and the many times, Lord, that I've not done those things that you've asked me to do. And I pray, Lord, you'll help me, Lord, from this time forward to do that that's pleasing to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, today through his service, God, that somebody be touched, Lord, and the message might go forth, Lord, that uh, somebody could be saved and know Jesus as a personal Savior. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless, God, these the Gideons as they uh, take the Word of God, Lord, and they hand it to people, Lord. I pray that those people might receive it, Lord. And, and Lord, not just receive it, but actually read it, Lord, and see what thus saith the Lord. And I pray, Father, today if somebody is lost, Lord, this might be the day they come to know Jesus as a personal Savior. And I ask you to bless these young people, Lord, encourage them, help them be what you'd have them to be. And God, we're going to ask all these things and pray it in the name of Jesus. And amen. ask our ushers to come and uh, we'll take up our morning offering. Brother Danny, would you ask the Lord's blessing on the offering this morning? Let's stand and sing together hymn number 199. Hymn 199.
But I'd like for us to sing. You, if you don't have one close to you, don't worry about it. I think you know this song in him, but a uh, song I've learned many, many years ago in Sunday school. But uh, it's called the Bible. It's on page uh, 332, right down to the bottom of the page. If you need to know, see the words, uh, you're going you're gonna to see them right there. The Bible. You caught on to the theme this morning, <laughs> how firm a foundation, the B-I-B-L-E, ask the book for me, amen. I'm glad we have the word of God this morning, and I appreciate those in all ministries that are sharing the word of God, and especially the Gideons and, and the work they're doing, and uh, just thankful, as our pastor always says, thankful to be a part of it, and um uh, uh, so we'll have Brother Wade come up. He asked me to pray uh, before uh, uh, he speaks, and uh, we'll go ahead and pray and just add his Lord, ask the Lord's blessings on the service this morning. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, Lord, as we come to you this morning, Lord, with thankful hearts, Lord, the privilege of prayer to, to come before you, Lord, and to thank you for all your uh, blessings, your goodness, Father. We, we thank you, Lord, for the word of God, and Lord, it's the word for us, Lord, and Father, it showed us, Lord, how we was lost. But, Lord, it also showed us, Lord, how we could be saved. And we thank you, Father God, for the work, Lord, that's being done, Lord, to get people to know Christ, Lord, to be saved. Bless Brother Wade this morning. Lord, just give him the unction. Lord, just uh, uh, help him, Lord, to expound in the Scriptures, Lord, what you've given to him. And, Lord, help us, Lord, that we may have a hearing heart this morning. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. Brother, I haven't heard that song in I don't know how long. And uh, when I come to a traditional church, y'all didn't get the memo that you were supposed to change and get modern. I'm always blessed. And that, that first old hymn we sang... I thought of my mother, who was a church musician, and I, I couldn't sing. I just cried through it. It's good to be back in a house of the Lord like this. Now, the, the introduction people have been telling you that Gideons are a great organization. Well, I hate to bust their bubble. I'm going to tell you a secret. The Gideons ain't great. God is great. And if he uses us Gideons to do his will, amen. 
I'm going to tell you a story this morning about a young man who lost his way. There were a lot of bad things that happened to David Berkowitz, and he didn't have that anchor. He didn't have the B-I-B-L-E in his life, and he was led astray, and it can happen to any of us, I guarantee you. Some of you may, rem may be familiar with the name David Berkowitz. He was an international figure for a very short time back in the 1970s. The 44 caliber killer, he used a snub-nosed 45 pistol, and he killed six people in New York City. David Berkowitz, an American serial killer, he murdered six people in New York City from 1976 to 1977. Who is this guy? Why did he kill these people? And where is he today? Well, let's go back to the start. David Berkowitz was born June the 1st, 1953. His mother was a single, poor Jewish girl. She had no means to support this baby. And so she put him up for adoption immediately. He was adopted by Nathan and Pearl Berkowitz. Now, the Berkowitz were a childless couple, so they were happy to have a baby. They owned and operated a small hardware store in Brooklyn. And this is where David grew up. Early on, his parents told him that he had been adopted. His mother, Pearl, doted on him, as most mothers would, especially one who had been denied to have her own natural child. His world was shattered as a young teenager when Pearl contracted cancer and died. The only person that had shown him love was just torn away from him. His stepfather remarried a short time later. And David and his stepmother did not get along. He had an unhappy childhood. As soon as he graduated from high school, at the age of 18, he enlisted in the Army. At this time, the Vietnam War was in full swing and he, he fancied himself to go over and save everybody from the Viet Cong. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, he wound up in Korea, not in Vietnam where he had hoped to go. Army life did not offer him much. His only accomplishment in those three years was that he obtained a sharpshooter's uh, rating with the M1 rifle. When he got out of the service, he, uh, he went back home. He got his own apartment because he didn't want to live, continue to live with his step-parents. And one of the things he did, he had been told that his mother had died in childbirth. And he bore some guilt because he thought somehow he was responsible for her death. He 
began an investigation in to, find, to find his who his birth parents were. Who am I is what he was trying to say. And much to his chagrin, he found out that his birth mother, who his birth mother was, and she was still alive. She had not died. He met her, and it was a blow to him when he learned that she put him up for adoption. He was rejected by his birth mother. He went from two or three menial jobs and he wound up as a postal worker sorting mail. Uh, one day, one of his co-workers said, Hey, Dave, we're going to have a party tonight. Why don't you come? He was single, living alone. Uh, he was depressed. He had a lot of issues, and somebody had reached out to him. A party, girls, alcohol, okay, that'll beat going home to an empty apartment. So he joined the party, and he says that it was held in a wooded area in a park in, in New York City. I was kind of surprised to to learn that there was enough uh, wood in uh, New York City that people could gather like that out in the woods, but they did. He said he got there, and there were campfires set all over the place, and young people were, were gathered around the campfires, a lot of loud music, alcohol, drugs, something he had not experienced totally like this. He said to his friend, hey, what is this? His friend said, we're angels, and we worship angels. Really. David found out later on that they were actually demon worshipers. And so this became his world after work. He devoted himself to the study of demons and satanic worship. Uh, he would do incantations, and I don't even know what that is, but he was seeking communication with Satan. As he progressed in this satanic worship, his crime spree began. He was a pyromaniac. He set 1,400 fires in and around the boroughs in New York City. He acquired that uh, 44 snub nose, a bulldog revolver that you saw. And he started stalking lovers' lanes where there weren't many lights and young people would go after a date. And he would indiscriminately walk up to a car, shoot through the window at young couples. He killed six people. One man is permanently blind and there were other people who were wounded. He was arrested, as you saw, and he was charged with six crimes of murder. He pleaded guilty to six counts of murder, and without a trial, he was sentenced to six life terms to be conserved, served consecutively, 25 years to life. I guess that means a minimum of 25 years and then for life with no chance of parole. I'm going to do something I don't normally do when I speak, and 
I've got his testimony here, and I tried to learn to paraphrase it this week so I could share it with you. But the more I read his words, you know, your, your personal testimony is personal. Nobody else can give that. So if you guys will allow me, I'm going to read his testimony. I want to read it to you because I want you to feel his words. And he expresses it. He's the only one that can express his experience. That's why your and my testimony is so special. When, some, when you're witness to somebody and they say, well, where do you go to church? Well, that's just like the woman at the well. You know, she wants to change the conversation because it's getting hot in her heart. And people don't want to listen to you. Give you testimony. Nobody can argue or discount your testimony. So let me read what David says. This uh, testimony was in the Gideon Magazine, 1997. So what I'm reading to you happened 25 years ago. David says, I am sitting in a prison cell. Maximum security prisons have been my home now for almost 20 years. You see, at one time, I was a devil worshiper. I was living such an evil and wicked life that I was actually seeking out demonic entities to communicate with them and in turn receive their powers. They found a lot of satanic things in his uh, apartment. A Ouija board was one of them. And I've seen those things. Some of y'all have too. David says, I became the most literal sense a servant and soldier for Satan. I took innocent lives, and I am deeply sorry for that. I was such a fool. Not only did I destroy the lives of others, but also I threw away my own life. Now I am doing more than 300 years behind bars, serving six consecutive sentences with no hope of ever being paroled. My first 10 years in prison were difficult. I battled depression, loneliness, and an attempt on my life when he was at Attica Prison. Another inmate tried to slit his throat with a razor blade. In David's own words, one cold winter's night, I was walking in the prison yard. Another inmate walked up to me, introduced himself to me, and he said that Jesus Christ loved me and had a plan for my life. I noticed he had a big smile on his face and a little Bible in his hand. After he had said these words, I laughed at him. And I told him, there's no way God could love me. I was too evil. And that this man was wasting his time. Yet, this guy had such a friendly and compassionate attitude that even though I had rejected what he said, I felt down, I felt drawn to him because I think I was hurting so deep inside. The inmate's name was Rick, and we quickly became friends. As we walked the yard together day after day, 
He told me much about his life and how he decided to become a Christian. I told him I was Jewish. He said, that doesn't matter. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Rick explained to me that we all need a Savior. There is no such thing as a righteous person and that God loves everyone. Oftentimes, Rick would read portions of his New Testament to me as we walked in the yard. Within a few weeks, he gave me a small Gideon New Testament with Psalms and Proverbs. He told me to read the Psalms. Now, you know, that's an interesting point. When, uh, when you go to a class to how to share your faith, the only thing I remember hearing was the Roman road. But Psalms is, is a great source of peace. David was one of the greatest theologians, in my opinion, in the Old Testament. So he was told to read Psalms. He took the little Gideon Bible and he began to read it late at night when it got quiet. You know, sometimes that's the only time we can communicate with God or he can reach us when things get quiet. I would pick out a psalm and write, uh, at random, just open the book and read one. Listen to this. I was amazed I had never read the Bible. That is, I find that statement just astounding. The words were so beautiful. I read about King David's struggles and sufferings as he poured out his heart to God. The Psalms were full of his pain as well as his praise. As I read, it seemed as if God was indeed talking to me. How many times have you been dealing with something and you just cried out to God, help me, and then you open the book of God, his holy inspired, inerrant word, and the words just come off the page and grab you. And it was what you read was just meant for you that day. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper that Jesus promised to send when he left the disciples. As believers, we are not alone. The Holy Spirit is there. But he's polite. He doesn't barge into your life. You have to invite him. And that's the key to having God speak to you through his word. One night, it happened. It was close to midnight, and I was alone in my cell. I was looking at Psalms 34, and when it came to verse 6, it read, This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all of his troubles. The Bible teaches us, if we seek God with all our heart, we'll find him. That's a spiritual truth. That is writ in granite. It works. It works. David goes on. It was at that moment that my heart began to burst. The words pierced my soul. Everything to see hit, seemed to hit me at once. All the guilt... I had inside of me. 
You know, being forgiven is a liberating thing. Being forgiven liberates your soul and your spirit to do everything that God wants you to do. All the guilt I had inside of me, the anger rejected by his mother, his stepmother died, the people that should have loved him and nurtured him, his shame, my feelings of being a failure, my loneliness, and deep hurts, everything. I shut out the light in the cell. Then in the darkness, I felt a compelling desire to get down on my knees by my bunk and pour out my heart to God. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. I was filled with remorse over all the evil that I had done. I began to pray, listen to this, to talk with God as if he were right there in the cell with me. Is there a better definition of prayer than that? Talking to God and having him speak to you because he is with you. The Holy Spirit was in that cell with David Berkowitz. I asked him to forgive me for everything I had done. I told him how sorry I was and threw myself at the mercy of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. When I finished, he emptied himself. He confessed all of this evil. And when I got off my knees, it felt as if a tremendous load had been lifted off me. Didn't Jesus say, my yoke is light? Come to me, you are weary. That's what David Berkowitz did. And boy, he carried a bunch of sins with him. He had a heavy yoke. Then he says, that was the moment I was born again. Although it would still take a while to understand all that had taken place. Salvation doesn't depend on what you understand. It depends on what Jesus did for you and me on the cross. Amen. You don't have to understand it. I do not understand the internal combustion engine or the hydromatic transmission, but I can put the key in the switch and go to Walmart and get a quart of milk. You don't have to know all of it. You ain't supposed to know all of it because God is bigger than you and I. Okay, he is, now listen to this. I serve God at the prison I am in. When God calls you, you ain't got to move. You just got to do what you're supposed to do. And David took three stones out of the riverbed and slew the giant. Now you take what you got. And you put your life in Jesus' hands, and things will happen. Good things will happen. I serve the Lord where I am, Berkowitz says. He leads Bible studies in prison. Uh, wardens are anxious to have him transferred to their prison because his presence is a calming effect on those people. Because he has got the answer. And it's in the word. 
Although I still take a while to understand that all had taken place, it was the turning point in my life. How many of you can remember? 12 years old, maybe you came down this aisle in this church right here and took the preacher's hand and something happened. Now, at 12 years old, you certainly can't understand it. But you know something happened. It makes a difference. I felt God's peace. He was 33 years old. Had, had lived a terrible, terrible experience. For the first time in 33 years on this earth, I began to experience the breaking of the chains of oppression and torment. Now, the devil wants to keep you pushed down. Have any of you ever agreed to take a job, a, a new job in church, or went off, started to go on a mission trip, or to witness to somebody, and all of a sudden you're getting all this bombardment? That's Satan. That's spiritual warfare. He wants to keep you pushed down. He doesn't want you to exercise your faith muscle. You want your faith to grow? Exercise it. That's how we grow, trusting in God. David says, now 10 years have gone by. This was in 1996 or 97. He gave this interview. So he's been a believer for 10 years. Through God's grace, I am still walking with Jesus every day. Who are we walking with tomorrow? Walk with Jesus. I serve God at the prison I am. I love Jesus Christ. He is not only my Savior, but my Lord. Those are two different things. Now, when Jesus is your Savior, you got your life, your fire insurance policy. When he becomes your Lord, he's the most important thing in your life. Can you have one without the other? Yeah, I did for a long time. Make Jesus the Lord of your life, the most important, more, more important than ACC basketball, golf, going to the beach. Yeah, whatever it is that you really enjoy. In 1987, God sent a born-again prisoner with a little Bible and a big smile into my broken-down life. Now, the old things have passed away, and all things have been made new. The evil son of Sam has been given a new name. He calls himself the son of hope. And his, uh, this article was signed, Thank you, Jesus, David Berkowitz. We want to thank you for, for allowing us to speak here and to come to this great church. I just love coming up the mountain to Bethany and seeing all the beautiful colors and being here with you guys. What a powerful testimony. But that's what we all have when we've accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior. It don't matter where you've been or what you've done. We've all got a powerful testimony because we're talking about a powerful Savior. Amen. Amen. And as I was, I remember one of my first sermons I ever preached, I used him as a focal point. And I thought about one time as I was sitting there, how I was a prisoner. How I was a prisoner to sin. Sin had a hold of me, sin had a hold of my life. And you see, I was sentenced to life without parole. The 
Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I was condemned to a devil's hell. And there was no hope. Thank God for the word of God. Now, like Paul, I'm no longer a prisoner of sin. Sin doesn't have a hold on my life like it once did. I'm no longer condemned to a devil's hell. But thank God through the blood of Christ, this morning I stand before you a man that's been freed. Free. No longer sentenced to life, but friend, I've got eternal life this morning. Through Christ and Christ alone. What is your testimony? Are you still a prisoner of sin? Are you still seeking after those things to satisfy the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of the life and all these things that the world has to offer? Is that where you're getting your satisfaction from? Jesus loves you. That's what God's word is. This is a love letter to you and to me. And can I tell you this morning, sometimes whenever I just get a little wrapped up in myself, sometimes I start seeking my own direction and, and I think, start thinking about my own will and my own life and then I come across God's love letter to me and he reminds me how much he loves me. Sometimes I forget. There's a word in God's word that God uses a lot of times for us, and it's remember. Why? Because Chris Taylor forgets. Chris Taylor forgets. I, I, I know. You say, well, how hard is it to forget? You get your eyes off God, and you get focused back on the world, then you'll forget about what God's done for you. But God says, remember. Remember my love letter for you. Remember what I did on Calvary's cross for you. I'm thankful for his love letter this morning. Appreciate Brother Wade coming, sharing with us what God's laid on his heart. And for the many souls that's coming to know Christ. And thankful that we can be a part of it. Let's all stand this morning. If we get a little hymn of invitation, we'll we'll just uh, go through a verse. And, and if you got a need this morning, maybe today you need to get saved. Maybe today you just need to get things right with God. You know, God says today's the day of salvation. Not yesterday. Yesterday's done gone. Not tomorrow, because tomorrow may never come. That's why he's saying today is the day of salvation. Brother Gary. 162. saved, ain't it? It's good to know about the same Jesus that saving souls in prison. Amen. All hearts free.